our master, true to his obligation, answered that those secrets were known to but three in the world, and that without the consent and cooperation of the other two, he neither could nor would divulge them. But this is Freemasonry's third degree ceremony, when the candidate becomes a master mason. It reenacts the murder of Hiram Abiff, the mythical architect of Solomon's temple. Half a million men in Britain today, including some 22,000 police, have been through this ritual climax. The ruffian aimed a violent blow at the head of our master, but being startled by the firmness of his demeanor, it missed his forehead and only glanced on his right temple, but with such force that it caused him to reel and sink down on his left knee. Recovering from the, shock, the mystique and the, the, the power of a ritual we'll like this can certainly sway some people who would perhaps rather not think for themselves or who would do anything rather than give up that feeling of support and backing and strength that they get from the group. And those are the people who will say, I was following orders. You know, I couldn't betray my mates, even though whatever it was was patently wrong. Nowhere is the pressure to stand by your mates stronger than in the police, where generations of detectives have used Freemasonry as a cover for corruption. Tonight, we reveal the hidden Masonic connections in some of Britain's biggest police corruption scandals, and the Scotland Yard network, which one Masonic detective branded a firm in a firm. In 1987, Detective Alan Holmes, a Freemason who had joined the craft while serving at Croydon Police Station, faced the ultimate test of his Masonic loyalty. Holmes was not corrupt, but was under great pressure to betray a Masonic colleague. Scotland Yard's anti-corruption squad, CIB2, believed he knew of crooked links between a Masonic detective commander and Freemason Kenneth Noy, convicted of receiving part of the £26 million worth of gold stolen in Britain's biggest ever robbery, the 1983 Brinksmat job. Unknown to Holmes, CIB2 arranged for him to be secretly recorded as he gossiped to a fellow detective in his lodge. When Holmes was told he had unknowingly shopped his brother Masons, he became deeply distressed. One morning, in his back garden, he shot and killed himself. Former Detective Sergeant John Simons worked with Holmes in the 1960s. I knew Teffy Holmes very well. Um, he, was, uh, he was my right-hand man, really, for, for some time. Whenever I was on night duty CID, I always took Taffy along with me as my uh, assistant and companion. He was a strong man, uh, very good man, strong, honest, uh, no fear in him whatsoever. At the time of his death, Taffy Holmes was the master of Manor of Bencham Lodge, which had at least five serving or retired policemen among its members. The conflict between Holmes's loyalty to masonry and the police was too much for him. His fellow masons from Croydon Masonic Hall sent symbolic wreaths to his funeral. One was inscribed, To our brave, wonderful and worshipful master, who chose death rather than dishonour his friends and workmates. Some of his lodge brothers clearly thought that Taffy Holmes, like Hiram Abiff, had died rather than betray Masonic secrets. Our master remained firm and unshaken. When the villain was armed with a heavy maul, struck him a violent blow on the forehead, which laid him lifeless at his feet. Freemasonry and police corruption have been bedfellows for decades. Many allegations involve outsiders using Masonic bonds to persuade policemen to drop prosecutions for offences like careless driving. Former Inspector Brian Hilliard, now the editor of Police Review, is a non-Mason. He recalls an incident from his own career. The sergeant said to me, I was in a certain place last night, and Mr Brown, who I believe you're going to prosecute me, approached me and wondered if you have to go forward with the prosecution. And I said, well, you know, it will depend entirely on what the witnesses say. Uh, he was prosecuted, he saw me before court, and he says, does this have to, have to happen? I said, depends on witnesses. He was fined, and as he came out of court, he shook his head very sadly, he said, I don't know how we can do this to one another. Now, I know absolutely that he was a Mason and thought I was a Mason. Many police who are not in the Brotherhood are concerned about its influence. 
but Masonic policemen see no conflict between the job and the craft. Every police officer, the day he walks into what, whichever training establishment, takes an oath to her sovereign lady, the Queen, to, to serve her in the office of constable without fear or favour. And that is paramount. Whatever else you do in your life, whatever else you become, whether you're a Boy Scout, a Freemason, or you join the local golf club, it matters not. It is your obligation as a constable that is paramount. One of the dangers and one of the wrong things about Freemasonry in, in the, in the, within the police force is that you have here a group of people who have loyalties um, which are stronger and, uh, and um, more important to them uh, than their loyalties uh, 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 to the police force and to the public uh, as their oath. But why do so many young policemen become Freemasons? There's certainly a feeling that if you are a Mason, you better your chances of promotion or you better your chances of uh, being selected for in London for the CID. This was exactly the experience of John Simons. Having become a Mason in the army, he joined the Metropolitan Police in 1960. When he wanted to join the elite CID, he found his masonry came in very handy. But there was another vital qualification for young police anxious to become detectives. You either had to be corrupt or you had to condone corruption. You were tested in the way, you know. Um, they didn't want to bring into the CID people who were going to be horrified by corruption and were going to make waves and complain about it or, and whatnot. And you were really tested. You would, uh, not only uh, corruption in as much as that you would be prepared to accept money, um, or perhaps if you weren't prepared to accept money, you, would, you, you wouldn't make a fuss about other people, you would condone it. When Simons joined CID, a dangerous tradition prevailed at Scotland Yard. To keep the lid on serious crime, some senior officers took payoffs from major criminals and let them run the rackets. They gave them licenses. They used them as a sort of police force, in a way, to patrol and control the areas that they operated in. Now, that relationship was itself corrupt, um, but it was also oiled by money, which gave it another degree of corruption. It was a pretty nasty pot. In 1969, the Times newspaper was contacted by a small-time criminal claiming to be fed up with detectives extorting money from him. Reporters tape-recorded his next encounters with detectives, one of whom explained how the criminal could buy immunity to commit crime all over London. And the phrase that he used, that the officer used, was, I'm a member of a little firm within a firm. The implications of that, that there was a secret society, uh, a tight-knit group of police officers who dealt amongst themselves and who could guarantee immunity for criminals around the whole of the metropolitan area, that phrase gave a, a depth and a ring to what was to become a major corruption scandal. The officer who talked of the firm in a firm was Freemason John Simons. When the story was published, he was charged with soliciting a 50 pound bribe and suspended. While not denying his part in the corruption of the time, he claims the actual charge was absurd. Faced with what he saw as a fit up, he sent word to the officers probing the allegations that if jailed, he would expose many other corrupt detectives. The chief investigator was a Freemason, Superintendent Bill Moody, then head of London's obscene publication squad. I sent a message to Moody through another Freemason saying that um, I, I, I wouldn't stand for the, the fit-up. I knew what was going on. And uh, unless he stopped doing what he was doing, I intended to expose everything that I knew about Metropolitan Police, corruption, Freemasonry, his involvement in corruption, himself and uh, the um, porn, porn squad, which I knew, I knew about. In threatening to expose his brother Masons, Simons was only too aware of the traditional punishment awaiting Masonic traitors, being cut in half. The penal sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the body. The threat is perhaps symbolic, but according to Simons, the reality is just as bad. It's much more dangerous to receive a Masonic threat. It's not the sort of what the injuries to be inflicted. It means that a group of people who, who have power have this tremendous animosity towards you, a group animosity, if you like. 
and uh, the threat is that, that uh, certain bad things will, will befall you. The full penalty was that of having been severed in two, the bowels burnt to ashes, and the ashes scattered over... Simon's the... resolved to fight fire with fire. He gave a solicitor a dossier listing the crimes of fellow detectives to be published if anything happened to him. Some colleagues then offered Simons a deal, which he now discloses for the first time. I was more or less escorted out of the country. I received advice and money from, um, uh, from my colleagues. What kind of money? How much money? <clears throat> well, I, I received £2,000, which uh, in those days was an awful lot of money. Um, Where did this money come from? It came from uh, um, Superintendent Moody originally, but I'm not saying he supplied it all, but um, it was, you know, and, and various other um, colleagues of his. Simons fled abroad. When he returned seven years later, he received a two-year jail term. Ironically, by then, the very man who'd been investigating him was himself doing 12 years. Bill Moody had been jailed in 1977, along with Commander Ken Drury of the Flying Squad. These two Masons had both been taking colossal bribes from pornographers. Now, nobody seriously who looked at that case would other than accept that Moody took probably £40,000 a year in corrupt payments. So you're talking about a lot of money. Now, Moody was a Mason. He was a Mason in uh, his lodge in Surrey. And we know from the Porn Squad trials that he had dealings with at least one pornographer, a man called Ron the Dustman Davy, so-called because he was at one stage a dustman, though he was better known to Moody as a pornographer. They met at Moody's Lodge and they had subsequent dealings through Freemasonry Lodges. Now, Moody and Davy were involved in a corrupt relationship together and Davy was used as an agent by Moody to establish other corrupt relations. We know from the trial that Moody entertained pornographers at Masonic functions. And we also know that at least three um, of the people who were tried with Moody were Masons. The Porn Squad trials lifted the veil on a hidden world in which Masonic police were mixing with Masonic crooks in the secrecy of Masonic lodges. But honest Masons argue it is to the Brotherhood's credit that several witnesses for the Crown were also on the square. Some of the people who brought them to justice were in fact Freemasons, but primarily they were good investigative police officers and they were not, they did not depart from their, the true course of their duty. They pursued it with a rigor which it certainly deserved and which is fully merited. Back in 1877, exactly 100 years before the Porn Squad trials, bribery and corruption had become so endemic in Scotland Yard's detective department that complete reorganisation was necessary. Even then, masonry had played a dominant role. So although there are many honest Masonic policemen, Freemasonry and police corruption have always been hand in glove. For uh, a young officer to join the Masons, uh, there have got to be some question marks. I mean, why do men of 25, 26 want to join a fairly old-fashioned organisation which has uh, a fuddy-duddy image, um, a, a fairly serious image? They must see something in it for themselves. Yet there is a more charitable explanation for why policemen join Freemasonry, one which reflects the difficulties they face when seeking friendships outside the job. Serving as a police officer, one is uh, fairly restricted into the uh, social contact that you have. You're uh, constrained with the people that you meet outside of the police service who uh, may be a, a dishonest uh, character. And Freemasonry, as I saw it, was an opportunity for me to enjoy a social life outside the police service, whereby you met uh, honest and true people, because that's really um, the, the claim of Freemasonry, to be just and upright, true uh, members of society. John Simmons had been a Mason for 15 years, when in 1978 he moved from Scotland Yard to take charge of the CID in the City of London Police, the force which polices London's historic square mile. Corruption had been rife among city detectives for decades. In May 1978, a security guard was shot dead as he delivered £200,000 in wages to the Daily Mirror. 
It was the third violent robbery to hit the city in 18 months, netting the robbers £640,000. Each was carried out with an ease, indicating the gangsters had been working with corrupt police. Simmons started his new job the day after the mirror robbery. Already suspicious of some of the detectives now under his command, he decided not to reveal that he himself was a Mason. I knew that the principals involved in it were Freemasons, and I didn't want to go in there uh, with any uh, chance of being caught up with them. I just wanted to avoid uh, anybody knowing I wanted to do my job as it should be done. And uh, when officers uh, first met me, uh, all the usual signs, uh, language and uh, contact were made uh, to try and identify whether I was a Freemason. Simmons didn't respond to these Masonic approaches, but his ploy came unstuck when an ambitious and talented detective chief inspector named Phil Cuthbert met an old friend of Simmons at a Masonic function. Cuthbert, um, Virtually come running into my office the next day and uh, sort of said, you've been telling Porky's governor, you know, and I said, well, um, what's up, Phil? And he said, you're on the square, and then he mentioned the guy's name. And I either had to make him appear a liar, and I said, okay, Phil, um, I am a Freemason, um, but that doesn't cut any ice. That makes no difference to me. Uh, as far as the job is concerned, that's outside the job. And um, he said, fine, you know, it's lovely. He shook my hand and so pleased to know and everything like that. And within minutes uh, and during the next course of a few days, all the chaps that had tried to approach me, they all come in with sort of smirky smiles and sort of said, oh, you know, uh, uh, so pleased to know you're uh, on the square. And I said to everybody, it makes no difference. Um, the job will be done as it should be done, and it has no bearing. Uh, uh, and." Nobody said anything to the contrary, but um, it obviously wasn't um, taken on board of what I'd said. Simmons' fellow Mason, Phil Cuthbert, now asked if he could have a quiet word on the square. Simmons guessed this meant Cuthbert wanted to confide his crooked role in the robberies on the Masonic understanding that nothing would be revealed to anyone else. But Simmons was not prepared to treat confidentially any criminal admission, so he went to his meeting with Cuthbert with a concealed tape recorder. They met in a pub in Artillery Passage, where Cuthbert talked for three hours about senior detectives and their collusion in the recent robberies. He was also recklessly frank about his own role. I think Phil took Freemasonry in a very serious vein, and he believed that, as I was a, uh, now an accepted uh, brother, that he could talk to me under those lines. And, um, you know, many uh, Freemasons take the, uh, uh, the craft very, very seriously, like a religion. Uh, and that um, it's sacrosanct to them. And I think that he felt that he could talk to me under that vein and that I would not let him down. Simmons' evidence formed the heart of the case against Cuthbert in his 1982 trial for taking up to £80,000 in bribes. He was sentenced to three years in prison. But the man who gave evidence against him now became a Masonic outcast. I went to... Uh, um a meeting in the Connaught Rooms, which after all, I'm sure most people know, is virtually the, the headquarters of uh, British Freemasonry. And the chap who I'd known for many, many years um, uh, was there. Officer. As a police officer and uh, a Freemason. And uh, 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 we saw, we caught eye across, I suppose, uh, uh, twice the distance I'm sitting from you. And he just stared at me and just shook his head like that, um, run his, uh, his finger across his throat. I thought, gosh, what am I doing here? Um, I need to get out of this place, because um, if one man can do that, I, I need to get out. But what exactly did that gesture mean? Well, it's part of, uh, if one uh, breaches Freemasonry, then uh, you take certain oaths, and one of them is that you'd rather have your throat cut than to um, divulge secrets of uh, Freemasonry. The sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the throat and dropping it to the side. This is an allusion to the symbolic penalty at one time included in the degree, which implied that as a man of honor, a mason would rather have his throat cut across than improperly disclose the secrets. In I don't think anybody very seriously believes that these threats will be carried out, but uh, this doesn't detract from the psychological force of it. There's nothing like fear to instill loyalty. But I think even more powerful is the other fact that comes out 
in, in the ritual where they say not only will these appalling things happen to you physically, but you will be cast out from us in every other way. In other words, if you betray the Freemasons, you're like the bloke who runs away in wartime, the chap who lets the regiment down, the one who lets the side down, who suddenly becomes the total outsider, the strike breaker who's sent to Coventry for 20 years. In other words, they say, we're the most important thing in your life. We never spoke uh, that, you know, uh, uh, words and actions, and uh, it wasn't an idle gesture. It was one um, I took in, in the way in which he meant it to be given. John Simmons resigned from his lodge, dismayed at the gap between Freemasonry's high principles and their often shady practice. You agree to be a good man and true, and strictly to obey the moral law. You are to be a peaceable subject and cheerfully to conform to the laws of the country in which you reside. As portrayed in the Freemasons' own video, these moral principles are read out to every lodge master at his installation. But apparently too many Masons stray far from the Masonic ideal. Leonard John Gibson is a case in point. In 1979, Gibson was installed as master of the Waterways Lodge, which meets at the Southgate Masonic Centre in North London. He had reached this rank just seven years after his initiation. But masonry was not Gibson's only interest. At that time, Scotland Yard's flying squad was circulating a confidential handbook of London's top 100 violent thieves, among them worshipful master Len Gibson. On one page was his mugshot, on the next his criminal record, including convictions for handling stolen goods and shop breaking. Gibson's modus operandi, or crime speciality, was shown as armed robbery. Yet there were eight policemen among the brethren of the Waterways Lodge at the time Gibson was master. One of them was former Flying Squad Chief Inspector John Brian McNeil, who declined to talk to us. Perhaps these policemen saw no conflict in being in the same lodge as a convicted criminal. If so, they were not alone in this view, as later events proved. Soon after becoming Worshipful Lodge Master, Gibson pulled off one of Britain's biggest ever robberies, the theft of silver bullion worth four million pounds. Three months later, he was arrested, and in January 1981, at the Old Bailey, he was given a ten-year jail term, as were two other Masons in the gang. So what happens to Masons convicted of serious crime? They should be excluded from the institution completely. As far as being Freemasons is concerned, there should be no road back. That is my personal opinion. They should be excluded from the order and never be taken back. Not all of Freemasonry feels that way, for the silver robbers weren't thrown out. Throughout Gibson's five years in jail, he was listed by the Waterways Lodge as a country member. On his release, the Lodge welcomed him back. And even after newspapers revealed that the robbers were Freemasons, the Brotherhood's ruling body, Grand Lodge, decided they could stay in the craft. Then, six weeks ago, Grand Lodge changed course. At a 90-minute hearing, the robbers were allowed to plead their case in front of hundreds of Freemasonry's high and mighty. Most voted against the criminals, so they were expelled but only after an intense and unprecedented debate. We asked Freemasonry's Grand Secretary what was the argument in favour of the robbers remaining in the Brotherhood? Nothing that uh, really held much water. They felt that they'd repaid their debt to society, um, which I think is probably not quite true. I mean, it's one of those offences, if you look at the, the law, it's one which can never be spent. Um, they joined their Freemasonry, they felt they got something to contribute to it. And Grand Lodge felt that they might have something to contribute, but their presence as convicted robbers was an embarrassment. It took nine years for Grand Lodge to discover that armed robbers performing Masonic rituals alongside police was an embarrassment to the Brotherhood. <laughs>